Good morning. Uh, really is a great pleasure to be part of this very special symposium on the eve of the 10th year since the Fukushima disaster. Really like to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate. So it's been 10 years. What have we learned? <laughs> and uh, yeah, that, that's kind of a tough question. I'm going to move this out of the way here a little bit. And, and I thought I'd start by just reviewing a little bit of what has appeared in the literature over, over the, since, since the since the accident. And, and we're going to use the web of science as our de, fo, de facto standard for quality control on the scientific literature. And one of the key points here is that the uh, most of these top papers have nothing to do with biology. They're mostly about, uh, you know, the, the, the isotopes that were released and, and they're based on math, mathematical models, they're based on physics models, chemistry models. Going down the list, you again, it's the same, we're getting the same kind of pattern and it's really not until we get to number 46 that we see the first basic biology paper. Uh, this is this was a paper published on the pale grass blue butterfly system. This was an iconic paper by uh, Joji Otaki's group out of Okinawa who just happened to be working on butterflies in the area uh, at the time and, and noticed that there were major impacts on butterfly distributions. Uh, my group had actually been working was working there as well in, in, in 2011 and, and, and noticed similar impacts to the butterfly populations but this this paper was really stunningly well done in terms of both being done in both the field and in the lab and, and demonstrating a clear correspondence to the effects of the radioactivity under in both situations and, and, and thus providing a lot of support for the notion that that the sorts of uh, genetically based mutations that they were seeing was were indeed due to the radioactivity. I was actually a, a reviewer for this paper, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say. Um, let's see, moving down the list here, number number 130, we have a paper by, uh, again, my group, uh, headed by, in this case, Anders Moller uh, and some Japanese colleagues. Uh, this was sort of the first paper on the birds of the region. Uh, then we have another paper here uh, by our radioecology folks, uh, which again is... Um, you know, again, the, the title suggests that it's a study of biology, but in fact, really, it is, as you look through it here, again, it's a, it's a study of calculated doses and, and the possible link to health impairments uh, rather than any sort of directly measured biological consequences. And again, this is the first step. This is important work, uh, and it's, it's, it's very good work, but it's not a replacement for actually uh, looking at the biology uh, of, of what's going on in these areas. Again, going down the list, we're going to look at the top 500 here <clears throat> and, and add a few more of the biological papers. Uh, we have another paper from my group, The Differences in Radiation on Abundance of Animals in both Fukushima and Chernobyl. Again, trying to compare the two. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, I think. Uh, another paper by uh, Otaki's, Otaki's group on, on the pale blue grass butterfly. Again, there's a there's actually a whole series of papers by this group uh, that that document the, the the short and long term impacts as well as the mechanisms associated with with the consequences to these butterflies. And, and it really is an, an unbelievable model system for this for this kind of research. Uh, we have some more anecdotal reports uh, that are again. They're important in that they, they, they do uh, sort of uh, fit with some of the other, or they parallel some of the other studies that have been done by uh, other groups in other places. So for instance, number 319 here, low blood cell counts in wild Japanese monkeys after the Fukushima Aichi nuclear disaster uh, by, by a group of Japanese scientists. Uh, they basically had access to uh, uh, monkeys that were um, nuisance monkeys in and around uh, Fukushima City that were shot uh, because they were you know, a nuisance and so they uh, took advantage of this I believe to uh, collect some some data um, and that's all fine and good uh, but uh, but you know the, the sort of the, and, and then they did find some evidence of you know hematological responses that were very similar to some of the hematological responses seen in children living in Chernobyl affected regions uh, human children and so uh, you know again kind of powerful in the sense of, of paralleling these two parallel stories and in completely independent scenarios. Uh, important study in that sense. Unfortunately, as best I can tell, it's not been followed up. Uh, and, it's, and, and, and the other issue is that these were monkeys that were living in Fukushima City, which was contaminated, but not nearly to the same extent as contamination levels in the center of the exclusion zone. And, and to my knowledge, uh, there have been really no systematic studies of, of these monkeys living in these most contaminated areas, which, again, would provide you know, incredibly valuable information about the potential impacts. Uh, you know, again, uh, you know, the monkeys have been vastly underutilized. There, there really are almost no studies of these of these wild macaques in Fukushima uh, 
apart from some of these ones based on adventitious data. Uh, let's see, number 340. <laughs> We've got another paper by by my group, uh, which is more of a review. Uh, and then we have a again kind of another anecdotal data up data paper on 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 whether or not uh, the testes of bulls. Uh, cows, you know, living in the uh, Fukushima area were affected. Uh, this work was kind of motivated by studies we had done with uh, birds in Chernobyl showing that fertility rates of male birds were, were dramatically impacted. In fact, many of the males were, were aspermic, they had no sperm. Uh, and this, this particular paper, I believe, found that there was no real evidence for any kind of morphological or structural differences. Uh, they did not have the opportunity to acquire, you know, fresh uh, sperm from from these 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 bulls uh, to look at the behavior of the sperm and, and, and uh, but anyway the uh, it is what it is again this is one of the problems when, when when the research is essentially unfunded and people are doing what they can uh, without having to uh, invest a whole lot in financially in it uh, let's see let's see coming down the list again number 440 top 400 of the top 500 morphological abnormalities in gull forming aphids again this was a, a paper that uh, got a lot of attention when it came out uh, i think i was a reviewer as well and it was uh, you know again uh, kind of uh, you know it wasn't replicated it wasn't uh, conducted in the most radioactive areas uh, it was kind of again sort of this adventitious study it just happened to be there and, and they noted that there were uh, content, uh, deformities in these aphids uh, but again not not particularly helpful in, in the sense that uh, we don't know how general that phenomenon was although we did have the uh, the butterfly work to compare it to but it uh, it just it just was kind of a one-off study and, and 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 it's because again no funding has been insufficient funding insufficient resources have been made available for this kind of study uh, another study I'll mention again a little bit later, number 491 on the list, morphological defects in native fur species. Uh, this was, I think this was a very well done study uh, and uh, an important study in that it documented deformities in the development and growth <coughs> of these trees uh, that paralleled what had been reported in Chernobyl by, by my group among others. And, uh, and so again, sort of a repeat, repeat an, independent, an independent observation of a similar consequence to a group of organisms in both Chernobyl and Fukushima. Again, that's pretty powerful stuff in terms of documenting this linkage between radiation and, and its consequence. So, again, is uh, this, these are the top 500. And, and you know, when, when, when you really, um, you know, get down to it here, uh, again, more than 7,800 articles have been published about the Fukushima accident in, in the Web of Science database. So these are, these are the, you know, the, the top papers. Almost all of these studies relate to the distribution of radionuclides. Uh, uh, there's a few studies looking at other aspects of, of, of the physics and, and geography and psychology and, and you know, medical impacts. But uh, as far as I could tell, only 10 of the top 500 related to biological consequences, 2%. And, and so, so we haven't, you know, despite all of this flurry of interest, we really haven't learned all that much as best I can tell. Until recently, um, you know, radioecology has been the study of the ecology of radionuclides, the distribution and abundance of radionuclides, rather than any kind of biological phenomenon other than those relating to the movement of these radionuclides. It's only been in the past decade or two that the, there's been a shift to include uh, sort of a shift in perspective uh, to more of the effects of radionuclides on the ecology of organisms. And that, that really has been <laughs> one of our contributions to the field is to change this perspective. And, and you know, to this end, we have uh, taken a, you know, a, a more uh, deductive kind of approach to the work and, 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 and to address these kinds of questions that, uh, uh, again, I've made this point uh, many times over the years, uh, you know, we're, we're interested in knowing whether or not radiation causes genetic damage, does it increase mutation rates, are there phenotypic consequences to elevated mutation rates, I, you know, are there changes in development and growth, are there fitness consequences to the mutation rates, are there effects on survival and reproduction or the expression of disease or any of these other kinds of uh, factors that that would affect you know sort of Darwinian fitness in some way uh, you know are there uh, is there any evidence for adaptation are these organisms somehow adjusting their life cycles uh, to to these radioactive environments to do better under these conditions uh, uh, you know and finally are there are there effects on population abundances and, and biodiversity and, and are there effects on on the ecosystems and that that's really this has really kind of been the umbrella to most of the work 
that we're doing. And, and, and so I'll just touch a little bit upon uh, whether or not we have uh, seen <laughs> much uh, going on in Fukushima. I've talked about Chernobyl effects over the years uh, many, many times, but uh, uh, you know, we haven't really done nearly as much work in, in Japan, but, uh, but we've done some. Much of this kind of research has been was really motivated by by this statement uh, that that appeared in the uh, Chernobyl Forum report of 2006, published by the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, which really attempted to promote the notion that plants and animals in Chernobyl have done extremely well, and that the uh, environmental conditions, primarily the lack of human disturbance, has had some kind of positive impact on the biota living in the Chernobyl exclusion zone, and that. That and, and you know, that there, like like so many of these kinds of statements, there there are elements of truth to it, in the sense that because there is no hunting, because vast parts of the Chernobyl zone are actually relatively clean and uncontaminated, it, there, there's some truth to the fact that that animals in some parts of the of the zone are are doing just fine and probably much better than they were before the accident or before there was a nuclear power plant. But um, the uh, but the truth is, uh, what we've noticed had noticed is that there are many many strong negative consequences in the areas of, of, of significant radioactivity. And these negative consequences take a, a wide range of expression, but include uh, reduced dis abundances of many species. Uh, we decided to look at the same kind of question in, in Japan. Uh, and shortly, we started our, our studies there in, in July of 2011, so just a few months after the actual accident. Uh, we, we attempted to repeat many of the same kinds of uh, studies that we had been doing in Chernobyl, so as to you know be able to compare them. Uh, in fact, and, and to treat Fukushima in some way as a replicate of the of the accident, uh, Chernobyl accident. Uh, this slide's a little bit out of date, but you know basically. Uh, what we've done is to conduct a, a whole bunch of what we call biotic inventories, uh, surveys of the abundances of as many species as we can identify, and um, and and to repeat these estimates of abundance, um, uh, you know, at, at multiple locations at multiple times over over the course of five six years. And we're we're about due to do another survey, uh, but I think we're up to uh, on the order of uh, over two thousand of these inventories. Uh, when we collect these data, uh, these inventories, we, we actually include a bunch of other uh, measures of the environment, including the radioactivity, uh, but we, we also look at you know, the weather and you know, whether there's water, the geology of the other organisms, plant and animal organisms that are in the same places, altitude, you know, and, and latitude, longitude, etc. And we put all these uh, together into a multivariate statistical model that includes radiation. And uh, it allows us to look at the effects of radiation independently of these other factors that also contribute to variation in the distribution of abundance. But you know, in the case of Fukushima, in the first year, in the first year or two after the accident, there really was uh, no, absolutely no doubt of the of the impacts. And, and I'm going to let's see if, if I can play this. This is this is a sort of uh, an area where we're, we're counting birds in this case and some insects. Uh, and this is uh, a couple of biologists in the foreground, and let me just start playing this. This is what it sounds like in the normal areas. It... You know, just birds here and there. It's noisy, yeah. <laughs> especially early in the morning. So, um, if we move on to the a comparable site, uh, just up the road, but in a much more radioactive area. This is this is what it sounds like. And what you'll notice is it's basically silent. There's 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 very little uh, going on. Uh, there's flowers here and there, and and there are a couple of birds here and there, but but really not very much. Very few butterflies as well at the time. And uh, you know you don't really need. Uh, statistics <laughs> for these kinds of data, but it does make it easier. Anyway, we uh, uh, published a bunch of uh, studies, uh, you know, our, our results in many different locations, but, but let me just give you the, the summary of the, of the effects. Uh, here is the sort of overall effect over, I think this was maybe five, you know, so this was 2011, 12, 13, 14, uh, and uh, so the summary of, four, you know, four, four years, and basically, uh, the, 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 the results were stunning. Uh, in, in essence, in areas of high radiation, there were very 
many, many, many fewer birds uh, living in these areas. Uh, pretty overwhelming stuff. And in fact, if we also looked at, we also looked at, you know, and analyzed these data in, in terms of biodiversity or species richness. And again, uh, similar, similar results, much less likely to find uh, a large number of species in a given spot in the more radioactive areas. There, there are clearly fewer organisms living in, in, in these more radioactive areas. And again, remember this is after removing the effects of, of some of these other environmental variables. So it's uh, these are pretty, it's, it, it's a, an overwhelming finding. Um, we don't know how it's changed over time. And, and you know, 10 years out, we would really like to go back and, and see what's going on. This is particularly important given that, um, you know, the, the radiation levels in Fukushima are, um, Dropping off relatively quickly. They're, 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 you know, the, they're, the, again, the first year there was a, you know, relatively high levels of, of contamination, uh, and relatively large effects, uh, and uh, I wanted to show this paper here because it represents a collaboration between our group of ecologists and and another group of radiation biologists or radiation physicists, really, <laughs> uh, out of, of France, uh, the RSN France, which uh, they, they took our data and they actually reanalyzed our data. They, 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 they estimated doses to individual birds. And, and what they found uh, was that our estimates, our, our, our findings of significant uh, effects were actually uh, very consistent with with the dose, they, they basically, uh, you know, repeated our study, but with much more rigorous estimates of, of the actual dose and, and found that, yes, indeed, as dose, predicted dose rate increased, uh, the uh, abundance of birds also decreased as we had found. So in some ways, sort of a validation of, of the work that we had done. Um, actually a very important validation. They've since repeated this kind of approach uh, with uh, the, the data that we've generated from mammals in Chernobyl and found basically the same effect. Uh, we published a paper just uh, a few months ago, in fact, demonstrating uh, that there was this dose response relationship for the mammals of Chernobyl. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, again, pretty similar uh, to the, the, the results and the findings in Fukushima were pretty similar to what we'd seen in Chernobyl with rather dramatic declines in abundance with increasing radiation. And again, when we look at the, uh, um, you know, the uh, the biodiversity, the number of bird species in a given area, again, very similar sorts of, of findings of declines in the more radioactive areas. Uh, what was really interesting, perhaps, was that, uh, maybe more interesting, was that in general, we were finding stronger effects, and you can't really see it in this graph, but in general, uh, there, were, uh, there was a stronger response, a, a more steep response to radiation in Fukushima than in Chernobyl. You can't see it as much because, the again, as I've mentioned before, Chernobyl is a much more radioactive place, a much more dangerous place than, than Fukushima in, 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 in many of these regards. And so uh, the radiation span is much larger uh, here and here in, in Fukushima. Again, uh, the, the range of exposures experienced by these animals is, you know, a tenth to a hundredth in, in most cases. And so, but anyway, the, statistically speaking, this observed response to radiation is much larger than uh, uh, than seen in Chernobyl. And this, this probably reflects the fact that in Chernobyl there's been, there had been a couple of decades of, uh, you know, since the actual accident giving some sort of uh, potential for the effect of selection uh, to remove the sensitive genotypes from these populations. So there's still a negative effect in Chernobyl even, you know, two decades out, but uh, it uh, is much less than seen in Fukushima that first year of exposure. Again, probably reflecting the high sensitivity to many of the individuals living in this area. All right, let's see, moving on, um, in terms of genetic effects, we see, um, again, not a lot of studies looking for genetic consequences of radiation in Fukushima, at least to date. And um, the, uh, you know, one of the first studies uh, was actually, one of the first studies was this one by Otaki uh, and on, on the butterflies, the pale blue grass butterflies, uh, where they really very, very convincingly doc doc documented the fact that the radiation seen in Fukushima was having genetic impacts on on these uh, butterflies. Uh, we published a little paper not too long after that uh, looking at the barn swallows. Unfortunately, because of uh, the fact that most of the barn swallows were gone from the more radioactive areas, <clears throat> there really was uh, not a lot of data to collect, and, and we, we actually were unable to detect any kind of genetic damage, at least in these barn swallows at the time. Uh, this was in part because 
us and, and most other scientists were unable to actually get into the Chernobyl zone or into this exclusion zone uh, in the first couple of years. It took us, took us a couple of years to figure out how to work in, in, the, in, the, in the Fukushima exclusion zone. Um, but there have been some other studies recently. Uh, for instance, uh, this recent study by, uh, again, mostly, I think this, these are mostly folks from France, where, where they looked at uh, genetic uh, damage to mitochondrial DNA, uh, or in this case, um, hypermethylation, uh, and, and again found that in the areas of higher radioactivity, the DNA was affected in this way. It wasn't clear what that impact uh, would have what the impact would be on these frogs in the long run, but but certainly there's a potential there for that. Um, you know, again, a few other very limited studies in this case of cows. Uh, you know, many of the farmers in Fukushima uh, opted to, uh, to keep their, you know, to keep feeding their cows and not 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 to cull them in response to the government. Uh, and uh, and so uh, they took advantage of this to to look for any signs of deleterious effects. Uh, <clears throat> they generally uh, did not find any uh, obvious deleterious effects to the cows beyond uh, at least none related to the radiation exposure. But again, sample sizes were quite low and the exposure rates were quite low, and so not necessarily the most powerful experiment possible. Um, again, a little bit of uh, you know another study here with some of the Japanese field mice. Again. Uh, and, and basically finding that there was, was some evidence of, of some impact on, on components of the, of the uh, blood system in, in the mice, as had been found in, in, in Chernobyl. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, again, not, not too surprising given that in Chernobyl uh, there have been many, many examples of increased mutation rates. Uh, and I guess I'm, I'm not going to bother going through the details of the Chernobyl work because I think we're running out of time. But again, and many some of you have seen many of these slides in the past. Um, you know, another another study that got a lot of attention uh, out of Fukushima uh, was the study of um, head size and presumably brain size in uh, Japanese macaques. And again, this was relevant because of similar findings uh, seen in um, you know uh, atomic bomb survivors, for instance. Uh, so particularly children who were in utero at the time of the atomic bombs in Japan often had smaller heads and, and also had cognitive uh, effects of these uh, smaller heads. They were mentally re mentally retarded, and and so uh, and and of course we we had published a paper on 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 brain size in Chernobyl birds, again finding that uh, the birds from the more radioactive areas had, had smaller brains and there were likely uh, some cognitive consequences to this in terms of we did see lower reduced survival rates for the birds with the smaller brains. And uh, um, and there had actually been uh, some of our Finnish colleagues had actually looked at mice in both Fukushima and Chernobyl and again found evidence that the, uh, the mice from the more radioactive areas had smaller brains. So, so, so despite the fact that this study on Japanese macaques had some limitations in terms of sample sizes, uh, in this case, uh, you know, 31, and the fact that the monkeys were actually collected from, from Fukushima City rather than more contaminated areas of the zone, uh, again, the, the, the suggestion uh, was that this, even this level of radioactivity had some, some uh, neurological consequences. Uh, but, uh, but again, still lots of work potentially, you know, that, that could be done in this area that just has not. Uh, another really important Fukushima paper, I think, in terms of ecosystem effects, potentially uh, relates to the fact that uh, you know it, it's, it, that some scientists, Japanese scientists, have observed that that there have been morphological impacts to the trees of the area, and and again, uh, where you know such that the growing tips uh, were affected by the radioactivity, uh, and leading to strange deformities in the growth and shape of these of these firs, and 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 again, uh, this. Um, is particularly relevant given that very similar kinds of deformities in, in growth and development had been observed in in uh, pine trees in Chernobyl. And so uh, again, uh, we're seeing parallels between what has been seen uh, and observed in Chernobyl versus what is going on in Fukushima. So this is all very uh, interesting and, and important. Right, well, for this last little section, uh, I'd like to share some of the work that we've been doing with um, in, in both, uh, well, we're going to talk about Fukushima, for the mammals. And, and again, you know, everyone pays attention to the mammals because we're a mammal. And, and they get all, <laughs> I get most of the, the TV time. And uh, so to get at mammal abundances, 
you know, it's, it's a lot more work. It's a lot more tricky than, than many of the other species uh, because they're smarter and they, they tend to uh, avoid being, being seen as much as possible. So uh, luckily there's been some major innovations in wildlife research, uh, the you know, motion activated cameras that, that are kind of camouflaged. And we've actually stuck about 70 or 75 of them into Fukushima and a little bit more than that in Chernobyl. And have managed to, you know, capture many of the, uh, these areas. And, uh, you know, again, it's, uh, these, these, these cameras are incredible because they, they capture these wild animals that, you know, in, in their, in their space. And, and you see animals that you might not ever see, uh, normally in the wild, including this Japanese Ciro, uh, again, a very interesting kind of goat antelope, the ubiquitous wild boar, uh, which are doing extremely well in, in some parts of, of Fukushima, uh, we have our you know Japanese fox again doing quite well. And of course, our wonderful Japanese macaque. Uh, Japanese monkeys are, are just you know incredibly interesting uh, critters. Uh, <laughs> lots of interesting social behavior. And then then oh yeah, you know uh, and we we actually did manage to capture a bear, uh, an Asiatic bear coming through Fukushima at one point. Uh, when we, we got this video, we shared it with one of the, some of the local folks and uh, the local TV station went absolutely berserk because they hadn't seen a bear in this part of Japan in, in over a century. Um, the other thing you see on these cameras are, you know, everything that's going on, <laughs> including uh, Google. You know, if you, want, you can look at Google Maps and Street View and you can actually take a drive through the Fukushima exclusion zone. Anyway, uh, when, we, when we first uh, did our first survey of the large mammals of the region, uh, and, you know, about five years ago, uh, we found it with, with a relatively limited number of cameras. And in this case, it was like 10 or 15 of them and did the analysis. And lo and behold, we found that there was a, actually a pretty strong effect of radiation. Uh, many fewer animals in the more radioactive areas. And this was from very early on in the season. Again, this was from uh, before 2015. And, and, and so we were kind of encouraged that this was worth pursuing and we stuck out another 50 cameras or so. Uh, it took us a couple of years to do this, but uh, we just sort of finished analyzing some of this work uh, recently. And, uh, you know, again, here is, uh, we, we, we put our cameras all over the place through the zone uh, that in, in the areas that we were actually most interested in that had similar ecology or similar, um, you know, sort of geography. Uh, but then, you know, with variable radiation, we show here a map with, uh, you know, the, the radiation levels plus, you know, sort of the border of the zone. And after doing this uh, uh, for a couple of years uh, and gathering a bunch of data, uh, and again, this is from uh, uh, 2017, 2018, we found that there was basically no effective radiation that we could detect. Uh, here's a here's a map that shows, um, and this, this is this is unpublished data at this point. This is the result. This, these are data from a, a master's thesis in my lab that we're, we're working to publish very soon. But it sort of gives you a hint at, as to the complexity of analyzing these kinds of data. The, these circles here show numbers, uh, average numbers of, of wild boar in a given area over a given time, and uh, corrected for a bunch of potentially confounding factors. And again, what you find is that uh, the wild boar don't tend to stay away from the main road here, but uh, they, they do increase in numbers away from the road, but they're also most abundant just inside the exclusion zone. They, they tend to be uh, uh, more abundant on the inside of the zone along the edges than anywhere else. And, and this was kind of, uh, you know, it, kind of threw us for a bit of a loop. Uh, it also, the data also showed that NDVI, has, which is a measure of plant productivity, food source for these animals perhaps, uh, was, was the best predictor of their abundance, but also the distance to the edge of the zone and whether or not they were inside the exclusion zone. The year also had an impact. The numbers were increasing over time. Um, and, you know, um, water also had some, some impact. Radiation significant, was significantly affected, uh, did significantly correlate with abundance, but, but not in the way that one would predict. Um, the, uh, when we look at the monkeys, here we have our fox in this case. In the fox, we see something slightly different. Uh, it, you know, the, the abundance, again, shown here in these big circles, uh, was also related to the productivity. But yeah, again, and, and distance from the edge was, was important in this case. The further from the edge, the, uh, the higher the numbers. They tended to actually be uh, quite um, uh, you know, they tended to sort of line up along the roadside uh, and uh, are closer to the roads. Again, not really clear why that was other than perhaps uh, availability of roadkill, but uh, uh, 
but no no real effect of no big effect of radiation in, in, on their distribution and abundance. And again, if we look at the next next organism, in this case, the Japanese monkeys, uh, again, similar sorts of effects, no effect of radiation at all. Uh, in this case, the longitude, uh, you know, distance from the coast was probably the most important factor, uh, and uh, and you know, edge effects were also important. And and you know, basically, what we what we what we felt was that the uh, what what all of this sort of added up to was the fact that the impacts of human disturbance probably the most important factor five years beyond the accident uh, in terms of determining the distribution abundance there was so much noise so much activity outside of the zone right along the edges of the exclusion zone in fact that uh, that many of the animals and the mammals were actually pushed into the exclusion zone as a result of all this activity all right well let's just uh, wrap things up a little bit here although there's been you know much learned about the behavior of radionuclides in the environment in Fukushima. Surprisingly little has been learned about the biological consequences of this accident and uh, you know again this I think uh, you know I've said it before many times it boils down to the lack of, of investment, the lack of resources available for biological studies and, uh, and uh, this has been um, a big shame that we've missed so much uh, in terms of new knowledge but, uh, but it is what it is. Uh, we did find, uh, you know, the literature does point to the fact that in the first year or two after the accident, there were large effects on, on the birds and um, uh, insects. Uh, and, you know, studies from, uh, from, from Otaki's group, uh, our, our group as well. Uh, there, you know, some of the, uh, the, there's some anecdotal information that maybe the mammals were also affected in the early years, but that this, uh, this, this, this effect probably waned, any kind of radiation effect waned or was, you know, hidden by, by the, the effects of disturbance that, uh, that uh, became so important during the, the periods of peak cleanup in and around the area where basically the top layers of dirt were scooped up and put into large bags. Uh, the current, you know, distribution, um, uh, you know, again, there, 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 there are some parallels to what we've seen in, in, in Chernobyl, uh, again, supporting the notion that, you know, that the radiation is the underlying cause. But, uh, but again, uh, the effects seem to be dissipating through time as, as the radioactivity levels actually actually go down rather rather quickly. Uh, bottom line, um, things could have been much worse in Japan, uh, particularly if the weather had been different. But uh, uh, again, it still provided uh, a lot of important lessons learned. And, and of course, the ongoing tragedy uh, it, you know, is, is, is incalculable in terms of the impacts on human lives. Um, but uh, that's about all I've got to say concerning the biological responses. I want to thank the organizers one more time for, for having invited me to participate and uh, wishing you all the best in these uh, uncertain times. Bye for now.